Okay, well, welcome back from lunch, everybody. Uh, this is our final panel before the concluding remarks. Uh, hopefully this panel will have the kind of lively discussion that we had in the last one. I'd like to thank all those panelists. It was really vibrant and candid and I think teasing out a lot of the issues that we really need to think about and address and continue to talk about. As I mentioned, I think this is a longer term project than than just discussing it in a particular symposium. And sometimes these projects, these turns, as uh, Michael Speaks mentioned last, uh, if not decades, with generations. So is this one, is this not, is this nothing, is this something? But let's maybe give it some thought and gestate. So our final panel is uh, one of a little bit different flavor. Um, it's gonna be handled by Michael Young, and I have to, Michael Young has been probably the person in architecture most uh, responsible for the discourse of estrangement or the idea of estrangement coming back within architecture, although it's a very active idea in philosophy, as I talked with Jacques Rancière last night. But it's really Michael Young's baby. So <laughs> this panel, if you don't like, is all Michael Young's fault, like entirely, even down to the level of idea. Uh, Michael Young is an architect and educator practicing in New York City, where he is a founding partner of Young and Ayata. His firm was awarded, I should note that uh, his partner is here as well, Kuten Ayata, a few, few rows back. His firm was awarded one of two prizes in the international, two first prizes in the international competition for the new Bauhaus Museum in Dessau, a major commission. Uh, they were awarded the first prize for their gorgeous collection of conjoined masses, whose beauty and mystery was only and unfortunately matched by their price tag. <laughs> <clears throat> Young, and, uh, Young and Ayata were the recipients of the Young Architects Prize from the Architectural League of New York, finalist in the 2015 MoMA Young Architects Program in Istanbul, Turkey, and their entry for the Del Song Citizens Gymnasium in South Korea received an honorable mention. Recently, the firm was exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Istanbul Modern, the Graham Foundation, and SciArc in Princeton Universities. Michael is the author of The Estranged Object, Realism in Art and Architecture, an increasingly significant and influential book that, like his work, brilliantly weaves together intellectual strands from philosophy, architectural theory, and incisively original claims for the future of abstraction and estrangement. Michael is among the most de desired and hardest working people in architectural academia. Even Donald Trump would be forced to admit that Michael Young has stamina. <laughs> <coughs> He is currently an assistant professor at the Cooper Union in New York City, a visiting professor at Princeton, uh, a visiting instructor at SciArc, and most importantly of all of these, the Lewis I. Kahn visiting professor in architectural design in our own school, where he has also taught before, and we hope he will continue to teach again. Uh, where he is currently offering an advanced studio exploring accelerationism in Iceland, which he and his students only returned from visiting uh, last week. Please welcome Michael Young as he showcases his formidable stamina, having been here for every session and still having the energy to moderate our last one, titled The Aesthetics of the Other, Alienation, Estrangement, and Unfamiliarity. Yeah, okay, stamina. Uh, start with that, because I'm gonna give you a warning. You're gonna be... Uh, episodically and periodically interrupted during this session by the convulsion of my body as the withdrawn objects inside, formerly known as lungs, produce a sound. <laughs> and there's nothing I can do about it. It's just how it goes. It's nothing like a good cough to estrange you from your own body. Uh, so as an introduction, we have a great panel. I'm looking forward to this immensely. There's a few thoughts I want to put about this word estrangement, or the estranged. And what I'd like to say is that usually when people hear this word initially, it has a negative connotation. Something along the lines of usually what happens when things go awry with relations with our spouses, or maybe with uh, familiar relations between a, a parent and a, and a child. Um, this will not probably be the estrangement that we will discuss today. This is more a rupturing or a sundering of a social convention, and even maybe deeper than that, it's the estrangement at the level of morality and ethics. If we extend it a little bit further, 
and think about estrangement and some other connotations and maybe ones that lead into the questions of alienation, which I thought were brought up uh, in a fascinating way in the discussions earlier today. There's a relationship where one becomes broken from the knowledge of oneself and the way in which one can act in the world. So this is more estrangement along the lines or an alienation along the lines with epistemology. That somewhere there's a break in the knowledge, that you, there's something going on here, but we don't know what it is. And how one can raise awareness to make that gap disappear, and then through the production of knowledge, hopefully appease the possibilities of how one can reconnect to the world. This is estrangement along the lines of epistemology. I also do not think we'll be talking much about that, but we'll hear our panelists and we'll hear our presentations and we'll see how that may come into our discussion because it is an interesting discussion in and of itself. Instead, I think what we'll be hearing about is estrangement in relation to uh, uh, aesthetics. And when we bring estrangement into aesthetics, it no longer has exactly those negative connotations. It has another sort of relation. Usually, the ways in which the familiar becomes unfamiliar. The ways in which the things that operate in the background of our everyday life take on the possibilities of becoming other. And if they can do so, then we have the possibilities of imagining another world in which we inhabit. So there is a liberating, maybe, a freedom that comes from an estrangement through aesthetics. And I think our artists and curators that we'll hear from today do a great job at that. This uh, has been brought up before, uh, Victor Shlovsky's text from 1917, Art as Device or Art as Technique, depending on the translation that you find. And this desire in this text to identify ways in which art roughs up our perception of the familiar and begins to estrange it to allow us to see it as potentially other destabilizing its meaning or maybe even emptying it of meaning for a moment and letting it then float free to make other possible connections. I think it's important to remember that this is, uh, for Shlovsky, a theory of prose. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to bring things that come from poetry into a theory for another art form. So in poetry, poetry often roughs up language to the point where you don't recognize the word in its typical manner. You see it as an object in a totally different context. It, defamiliarizes the normal language, and this is part of the way in which poetry can never be paraphrased because it has to be experienced as that defamiliarization of language. Prose is another thing. Prose is usually something that's trying to deliver a content, trying to deliver something through a set of uh, clarity, yet prose obviously has an aesthetic. And the ways in which Shlovsky then talks about uh, how someone like Leo Tolstoy could uh, estrange the concept of flogging by never using the word flogging, or in my own case, never using the word cough. Um, we'll see if that happens when I do cough and then you can get pissed at me and then the whole audience will be estranged and we'll have to talk about it in a different social communal array. But uh, the point with this is that estrangement in art or estrangement in aesthetics doesn't begin just there. We can actually pu push it back a little bit further. We can push it back, let's say, to the realism in France, in the writings of people like Emile Zola or the paintings of Gustave Courbet. Uh, artworks which produce an aesthetic affect that cannot be named by a simple emotion. Awareness of the body or awareness of the ways in which one body, one's body responds to aesthetic provocation that disturbs that to the point where one begins to think, feel, experience, sense, another possibility for how one can operate in the world. And that is a uh, political extension from the aesthetic realm, something that I think Jacques Rancière does an incredible job explicating in a book such as uh, Aesthesis, following this trajectory through the 19th century into the early 20th century, and how that has many instances of the ways in which that was once familiar, becomes unfamiliar, and open to new interpretations. There's another extension from this, and that extension is Michael Fried, another person who's arisen in this discussion and arisen in this conference because of his art and objecthood essay. But the thing that I want to raise here in specific connection to this panel is that Fried moves from a book on Courbet, takes a long break, maybe, what, 20 years, and writes a book on photography. 
because photography is an art form in many ways which has kicked into high gear the ways in which what we commonly assume to be the real can be disturbed, that there's an attention between reality and its representation. And in that tension, one becomes aware of the construct of the real. This is an important point because realism can be used in multiple ways, but when realism really kicks, it's when its critical aspect does not knock at your front door, it doesn't make you aware of its problems initially, you accept it to be real, you accept it to exist, and then on further or intensified or elongated attention to it, it roundhouse kicks you in the back of the head and you go, oh man, there's something really wrong here. And it makes you think differently, it makes you doubt about the assumptions you have of what is and what is not, what constitutes the real. It speculates on it, if we want to pull it back into our themes of the conference, themes of the symposium, I should say. And I bring this up because the photographers that Michael Fried references, uh, Jeff Wall and Thomas Demand and Thomas Struth, um, I think Gregory Crutzen in his work does this in an extraordinary way. And so I'm, I'm very happy that we get to hear him in this first presentation. A few words about Gregory. He's a photographer and associate professor and director of the Graduate Studies of Photography here at Yale School of Art. And his work has been exhibited widely, including MoMA, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, LACMA, and the Broad. His most recent photographic series, The Cathedral of the Pines, was at the Gagosian Gallery in New York. I saw the exhibit, it was uh, incredible. And I wanna to say too, on a personal note, I think it's been about 16 years maybe that I've been into your uh, photography. And I don't know if that's a number that resonates with everybody that's exactly my age, because that's the, release of Yola Tango's album. And I know that that's not maybe what you wanted to hear, but, uh, but there's a funny thing about this. And, and so it's how things move in and out and disseminate through popular culture is, is not a, always under control. But uh, I'm sure there's somebody maybe out here in the audience that's hovering in your mid forties that has uh, and then nothing turned itself inside out by Yola Tango. And that moment when you looked at that cover and you knew something was wrong with the real. And that is a startling and amazing moment in my life. And uh, I'd like to welcome Gregory Crutzen. Hello? Testing, yeah. When I was a child, growing up in Park Slope, Brooklyn, my father, who was a psychoanalyst, had his office in the basement of our brownstone. I was never quite sure when one, what went on below the living room, but I was acutely fascinated by it. I did not know what my father's sessions were, but I knew they were private, serious, and secret. I was acutely fascinated by it. I would press my ear to the floorboards of my living room and attempt to listen. I became transfixed by the act of trying to decipher the distant murmurs of voices that I could not quite hear. In retrospect, I consider this to be my first aesthetic awakening. This act of voyeurism, and also a separation from something that was, in the end, inaccessible to me. In 1972, my father took me to see the Diane Arbus retrospective at MoMA. This affected me profoundly. I hadn't before realized that photographs on a wall could have such power, authority, or psychological urgency. Even now, when I look at an Arbus picture, I see it through the eyes of a 10-year-old with a mixture of terror and awe. I didn't actually make my first pictures until I rolled almost on a whim in photography class and as an undergraduate at SUNY Purchase. From the first picture that was conjured in the developer bath, 
I knew this was a language that felt familiar to me. Something made sense about a still and frozen image with no beginning and no end. The very act of making a picture with a camera is an act of separation from the world. Peering through a lens is inherently voyeuristic. There, but not there. I've always been highly aware that photographs are a way of framing the world and have used self-referential devices such as doorways, windows, mirrors, and other architectural details as a means of activating a voyeuristic aesthetic. These framing devices serve to heighten the psychological anxiety and sense of remove from the subjects in the pictures. I consider, my, I consider my work to be rooted in an American tradition. I've been influenced by a wide range of artists, such as Arbus, but also Edward Hopper, Walker Evans, Raymond Carver, David Lynch, Steven Spielberg, and Cindy Sherman. Like so many of them, I attempt to explore the intersection of ordinary life with the uncanny, the moments in between moments of reflection, beauty and sadness, fear, and desire. Fundamentally, I'm interested in the search for meaning and human longing to connect with something larger than oneself. I have been essentially preoccupied with the same themes since I was a student at Yale in the late 1980s, using light and color to tell psychologically charged, ambiguous, and open-ended stories set in the desolate small towns of New England. Over the course of three decades, I developed a way of making pictures with a large crew and cinematic lighting. My most ambitious body of work to date, Beneath the Roses, was eight years in the making and took well over 100 people to bring to life. I shut down entire city streets and built elaborate sets on sound stages. But whether you're working with a team or not, photography in the end is a lonely endeavor. It is fundamentally an act between a photographer and a subject who are estranged from one another by a viewfinder. The almost impossible task is to make a connection and transform what is in front of the lens into something singular and beautiful. Photography is a limited medium, and yet it's those limitations that offer such immense possibility. Seven years, several years ago, around 2010, I went through a personal and artistic crisis. I moved out of New York and bought a side-by-side -side church and a firehouse in the Berkshires that would eventually become my home and studio. But whereas picture making has always been my compass and the central meaning of my life, during this time for several, for three years, I did not make a single picture. It was the first period it was not the first period of personal up upheaval in my life, but artistically, it was by comparison catastrophic. The very themes I've always been interested in, feelings, feeling separated, longing for connection, estrangement, these had all become real life. The only way I could, w could will myself through this time was through daily rep repetitions. I got up each day, hiked on the Appalachian Trail, swam the length of Upper Goose Pond in Beckett, Massachusetts, where my family had a cabin for much of my life, cross-country skied on trails in the winter. Over two years passed in this way, and then one day, on a ski trail deep in the woods, I came to a clearing, and something about the light and the moment itself evoked a sense of memory. I was transported back to a time in my adolescence when I was skiing with my brother. I felt connected to myself again, yet another aesthetic awakening. In an instant, the desire to make, new, make pictures was back in a way that felt old and new at the same time. I saw a whole body of work in my mind's eye. The resulting series shot over the course of three productions is called Cathedral of the Pines named for the ski trail. 
It consists of 31 images, all of which I will show you today, projected in a slideshow presentation. For me, at their core, the pictures are centered around a search for home, using light and color that is perhaps more reminiscent of 19th century painting than films. They explore the relationship between interior domestic space and the nature and the surrounding landscapes. The pictures also portray a sense of longing and a desire that is always slightly out of reach. Rather than talk about the images, which I think would only distract from the stories that, are meant to t meant for, that they are meant to tell, they are set to a special version of Night Falls in Hoboken by Yola Tango. <laughs> Evidently recorded 16 years ago, I had no idea. A song from the album, and then nothing turned itself inside out. From many, uh, the remix for this occasion is by Drew, Drew Brown, who's here, done from original masters of the recording. So without any further ado, let's see the pictures and hear this one. Fantastic. Um, so our next presentation is from Caroline Picard. Caroline is an artist, writer, publisher, and curator based in Chicago. Uh, she was the curator of the exhibit Ghost Nature at the Gallery 400 in Chicago in 2014, which focused on how the ideas from speculative realism and triple O were influencing contemporary art. The catalog, uh, interesting and important for this exhibit and for this symposium, contains writing from Graham Harmon, Timothy Morton, and Natrice Gaskins, all, all participants in this symposium. She's also the executive director of the Green Lantern Press and the co-director of Sector 2337, a hybrid art space bar bookstore. Sounds like my kind of place. Uh, her writing has been published widely. Please join me in welcoming her to give the presentation to Strangers Among Us. Thanks so much for um, having me here. Um, it's a tremendous honor to contribute to a discussion with so many thinkers who have directly inspired and shaped my own work in so many ways. In the midst of these ranging discussions of activism, macro and micro scales, reflections on beauty's arrest or aesthetic breaks, I want to propose a modest but concrete meditation on my cat. What happens when we think about our most everyday companions and the ways they disrupt or accommodate our human logistics, whether material and structural delineations of space or more theoretical and emotional fields? As we have been discovering over the course of this conference, it is not only the appearance of the building that exists, but also the building that recedes from which that appearance emerges. A building tied up in a not entirely forthcoming host of theoretical networks, politics, and economics that articulate its precise shape and location. I suppose I want to look at how that same operation takes place on another scale, vis-a-vis -vis my apartment's accidental resident. Timothy Morton brought up the idea of a public space for all things yesterday. This seems like a particularly essential undertaking if we do indeed wish to transform the systemic violence we currently inhabit and propagate in order to slow the sixth great extinction. What might it look like then to not only create space for more than human kinds, but hold it and maintain it. Working with water is one thing, perhaps, but what about rats? What about mold? What indeed would a coexistent architecture mean? I'm out of my depth with this question and propose instead a humble gesture of attention and focus to study what is nearest to me and in so doing, perhaps discover my own limitations. 
I tend to forget how strange our cat is. It is easy to take her presence for granted. After years, 10 years of cohabitation, I am accustomed to both her form and personality. I have a lexicon of adjectives used regularly to describe her, cute, reserved, sweet, independent, inquisitive, bossy, self-possessed, calculating, scampy, the latter inspired by her special proclivity to seek out abandoned, half-filled water glasses in our house and, while staring at me from across the room, insert a paw into the lip of the glass so as to knock the whole mess over. The activity provides our cat evident delight, despite or maybe because of whatever rage it elicits in me. Our understanding of one another has developed patterns over the years, patterns that lead me to say, I know her, our cat, Little Gray. I can describe her easily. She has yellow-green eyes and a mottled gray coat that burns ever so slightly pink around the edges when backlit. Compared to other cats I've encountered, she is small, but like other cats, quite athletic, prone to naps, vocal, and appreciative of dietary schedules. I would call her courageous without any evidence to prove as much. I would also say she is nice, citing her apparent restraint as proof. She rarely, if ever, bites or scratches humans, and instead of killing insects, follows them around until distracted by something else. Like all of the adjectives in my wheelhouse, however, niceness brings with it so many anthropocentric associations as to be misleading. In fact, all of those words fail, applying a human criterion that essentially eschews the host of unpredictable, irregular, and barely noticeable aspects of her character. Like easily overlooked letters in English words, silent G's, H's, or R's, unearthed only by strange accent, she has certain traits and tendencies on the very edge of my perception, possessing even more that elude me entirely. Whether I am not literate enough in the gestural vocabulary of her ears, or because I simply cannot parse all of the consonants in a mew, my adjectives fail to translate all of her, because ultimately her personality is driven by its unique manifestation of non-human catness. She lives only partially in language, orbiting the periphery of human speech like a foreigner who's taken up residence abroad. While impossibly inadequate, my words nevertheless give me access to her friendship and their finite but regular use in part at least, oh, sorry. Finite but regular use reflects, in part at least, the habit with which we relate to one another. I can anticipate her, she anticipates me. Despite our differences, I would say we are friends. The Walker Art Center has an annual internet cat festival in Minneapolis that attracts as many as 10,000 visitors. People who arrange themselves in, a stadium, in stadium seats to watch pre-selected cat videos and vote on their favorites. No doubt the museum is grateful for the event, not only because it captures a contemporary phenomenon, but also for its administrative statistics. Imagine, for instance, the delight of their grant writer when asked to report on museum attendance. I, too, have enjoyed the celebrity of the species. Like his 48,000 followers, I could watch Maru dive into a different box all day. Part of the appeal of those clips reflects exactly the strangeness I'm reaching to articulate, a specific form of often performative cat eccentricity. It resists total assimilation to humanist society while being relatable enough to be celebrated. Take the ninja cat as another example. The leggy animal appears on the far end of a corridor, approaching the viewer off camera. Each time the, the camera returns to its subject, the cat is closer, larger, and ever so slightly menacing. Or Teddy, the asshole cat, who sits calmly on a dresser until deciding without provocation to knock over a nearby bottle of pills and look at the camera yawningly thereafter. The strangeness of a feline companion is easily taken for granted in the midst of domestic routines, but every so often something happens to illustrate the gulf between us. What keeps returning to me is the opening part of Ulysses. I read the book years ago during a summer in Pittsburgh. Moshe, Nick, and I had a book club. 
Nick had read the book several times, so he was the default expert. He seemed older in other ways, too. He had a full-time job, for example, regularly got free drinks at the bar where we met, and often chided us, or me, for reading our designated sections hastily and last minute. I was using a friend of a friend's cousin ID at the time, who was 34 years old, Drusilla O'Brien. Nobody had any cats, and the reading group ended after a late night swim swimming caper in Shenley Park, for which we were interrogated by the police. All of which is to say I don't know why I remember this particular section of the book now, after so many years, but I do. When we first meet Ulysses' protagonist, Leopold Bloom, he stands in the kitchen talking to his house cat, the animal does not repeat a single phrase. Its diction changes according, it would seem, to Bloom's various prompts. Although Joyce uses the same format to relate other human conversations in the book, the animal's meaning remains inaccessible. It is similarly impossible to gauge how much of Bloom's meaning is conveyed to the cat when must rely on Bloom's English to infer the manner and tone of their interspecies discourse. In doing so, and despite knowing his understanding of the cat is limited, the reader naturally errs in crediting Bloom's authority. Still, they answer one another in a style of amicable habit, like neighbors speaking different languages, one on two feet, the other on four, each with separate access to separate combinations of phonemes, familiar with the impasse of mutual understanding, while nevertheless capable of enjoying a predictable companionship. Quote, the cat walked stiffly around a leg of the table with tail held on high. McNow. Oh, there you are, Mr. Bloom said, turning from the fire. The cat mewed an answer and stalked again stiffly around a leg of the table, mewing. Just how she stalks over my writing table. Purr, scratch my head, purr. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the lithe black form, clean to see, the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the butt of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the pussins, he said. Merk now, the cat cried. This is a big moment. <laughs> <laughs> The cat's phrases would seem identical at first, except for an easily overlooked R, as significant a difference as an element of code and DNA. That tiny differentiation, in that tiny differentiation, the cat indicates the subtle, though possibly infinite, variations of answers at her disposal. To take the presence of such a small letter seriously not only grants the cat a deliberate capacity to answer Bloom, but also highlights the human propensity to dismiss such differences as arbitrary. By introducing this unreasonable, nonsensical cat, Joyce presents an implicit and necessary relationship between the cat and the human, the stranger and the familiar, sense and nonsense, language and the possibility of non-linguistic worlds. Another memory comes to mind, what I should have remembered given that my own foxed and dog-eared copy of Ulysses is inscribed, for Caroline, a girl I danced with. Because actually it was never my idea that Bloom's cat has different phrases. Before that summer in Pittsburgh, an older boy gave me my hardbound copy of Joyce's book. Instantly I tore the jacket off, preferring the charcoal cloth with its silver embossed spine. I liked the look of it on my shelf, but had no desire to study its contents, rebelling in some way against his urge to the contrary. He was the sort who, with ten years' seniority, spent most of our conversations pulling books off his shelf to read select passages that might guide me through whatever ever sophomoric turmoil obsessed me at the time. I remember being impressed and bored in turns, as one who vaguely desired to match his body of knowledge someday without seeing exactly how such an achievement might occur and even, even wondering if there might be other more worthy preoccupations. Joyce is amazing, he said. Look, even the cat has its own language. He pointed comparatively. McNow, running his finger down the page to Murknow, me not seeing, this fellow who, for good reason, took pleasure in his hair, tapped his finger on the little serif R, making it appear and disappear like a blinking eye. Huh, I said. 
Every so often, I glimpse, I glimpse the opaque white flesh surrounding our cat's colored iris, and I am struck by the reptilian character of her eyes. It occurs to me that if she was even twice my size, she would not only kill me, but enjoy doing so. Suddenly, I touch upon the uncharted landscape of her being, that reticent horizon that evades apprehension as a monstrous, chimerical figure emerging in a dream and defying translation is shrugged off and forgotten the instant I wake up. It has no purchase in the linguistic chart of terms I use to filter my experience. As such, it dissolves the minute I encounter the hemmed edges of quantifiable things, the bed, the pillow, the floor, the sink. How indeed am I to incorporate and map her unknown and particular beastliness in an anthropocentric vocabulary? Or better yet, how do I remember the vagaries of her impression if I cannot hobble its corner with words? If I happen to catch Little Gray studying the shower, a recent habit she's developed, during which she appears lost in thought for hours at a time while staring at the drain, I puzzle over her opaque though evident purpose. Or when interrupting one of her naps, I touch the bottom of a paw and petting the soft, strangely distinct pads there, feel her wrap that same paw ever so slightly around my fingers, reminding me of a baby as it grasps the hand of a doctor. These fleeting moments highlight my own inability to comprehend the subject of her mind. She is not a snake, nor a child, nor is she my predator. She is a cat, something unsettled and unsettling. After she has seemingly spilled water everywhere on purpose and thundered off in a great seemingly triumphant gallop across the room, I realize perhaps this cat has a sense of humor in which knocking over glasses is a gag. Could it be? <laughs> The very nature of that question belies our estrangement, for if I know her, if we are friends, I should know the answer before ever having asked. Measuring humor is one of the first things you notice when meeting a person, yet here I am groping in the dark like one who suspects an intimate friend of stealing. Does my suspicion illustrate some instinctual insight into that friend's most private soul? Or do I only prove my own blindness overlooking that same companion's integrity, and in so doing, destroy, destroying any viable trust between us. Beneath our familial patterns, I am alienated from this dear being, just as Bloom is alienated from the meaning of his own cat. The entirety of their characters will always recede. Marcel Bruthers recorded an interview with a cat in 1970. The conversation lasts four minutes and 42 seconds. In the first few minutes, the artist peppers the cat with questions about art in French. He begins by asking if the cat thinks a painting, neither seen nor described, is a good example of conceptual art. The cat offers a small mew in an answer. Yet doesn't this color call back to the kind of painting that was being done in the period of abstract art, Bruthers asks? and the animal answers with a series of similar, but nevertheless distinct phrases, indicating what Bruthers apparently suspected at the outset of the interview, namely that the cat will respond, and to such an extent as to appear opinionated. The two carry on together from there. Bruthers raises the specter of academicism, followed by questions about the art market, remarks the cat takes an evident stride as it responds with its own assortment of strange, unintelligible answers. The first part of the conversation concludes with Bruther's suggestion that museums ought to be closed, and to that, the cat says nothing. On the surface, the cat in Bruther's interview is incorporated into a history of surrealist games. The animal becomes a foil for the art critic, the clown parroting conversations around the art world and its affiliated market. Cast in that role, the cat has nothing reasonable to add to that aesthetic discourse. Instead, it mocks those sophistic humans, maybe like me, <laughs> who presume their own lofty views, debunking cr critical art discourses on the one hand, while setting art with a capital A aside as something not entirely quantifiable. Despite that interpretation, however, Brothers and the Cat share a call and response dialogue. Throughout the recording, the cat remains enigmat enigmatic and embodied at once persistent in the use of its self-directed voice. 
Thereafter, artist alternates, the artist alternates between two mutually exclusive statements, ceci un pip, ceci n'est pas un pip. Between those phrases spoken primarily in French and occasionally in English, the cat replies in similar though increasingly emphatic phrases. Thus, the interview, with all of its coyness, conveys something specific and personal about its participants. It is not simply ironic. The cat's voice, like Brother's own, seems at first to be the medium of the artwork. Yet that same voice, so strange and singular, can only emphasize its source, an individual with agency and finite duration, one capable even of expressing a palpable mood from an ambivalent monosyllabic remark to a louder progression of various phrases that would imply exacerbation or excitement. As though in response to the artist's various statements and various languages, the animal's passion grows hysterically, proving again and again its ability to respond, its ability to answer, its ability to resist being reduced to a concept. The cat is and is not a ready-made. Like a ready-made, it is strange. Perhaps also like a ready-made, it is exploited for its capacity to elicit a strange feeling. To the human in the recording, the cat is presented as an aesthetic tool. Yet the listener cannot dismiss the cat's original individual existence. Its unique voice will not allow the cat to become simply a sign of its species. The voice locates the cat's body and will as a resonant material presence that the listener can neither access completely nor deny. The cat's double function an artistic foil and an individual feline being reflects brother's select phrase, this is a pipe, this is not a pipe. The pipe is and is not itself. The cat is and is not itself. Just as Ruther's cat is both present and remote to the human listener, Bloom's cat is at once inside and outside of the text. As such, Joyce admits an incoherent force, an other, and in so doing, reflects Bloom's own sense of otherness. Bloom appears endearing in this moment. As the reader follows his thoughts through banal and intimate reflection, they call them stupid, he says. They understand what we say better than we understand them. She, the cat, understands all she wants to. Vindictive, too. Curiously, he then attempts to conceive her experience of him, as though his sense of her vindictiveness makes him recognize her unique, responsive point of view. Wonder what I look like to her, height of tower? No, she can jump me. The remark, such a slight, fast blip in an otherwise robust novel, and yet in that moment, Bloom demonstrates his own uncanny experience of the animal he lives with. First, the cat is given a textual presence in the book itself, as her voice is transcribed. Yet also, she presents a meta-relationship to a text as, um, negotiating it even while being remote as she marches on top of Bloom's writing. Bloom recognizes her officially in the transcription of his own interior thoughts, and in doing so, he arrives at her otherness, then her power. He conceives the faintest glimmer of himself in her eyes, and the result is unnerving. Bloom's discomfort begins to mirror the cat's so-called vindictiveness, her otherness is perhaps too profound, disrupting an otherwise continuous experience of the human world. If this cat exists with its own discrete and coherent experience, then so do parallel worlds. Those of other cats, yes, but beyond that, many more besides. Horses, parakeets, whales, termites, computers, clouds, plastics, oil, and so on. An infinite number of worlds becomes theoretically possible, reciprocal though remote, each with its own internal logic and semiotics. They only penetrate the human sphere periodically, and often through disruption. At one time, I lived in an apartment gallery with this same cat where we hosted art exhibitions on a regular basis in our living room. An exhibiting curator, Shannon Stratton, published a call to take other people's collections on loan for the duration of an art show. Hundreds of expired Starbucks gift cards, Pez dispensers, protest buttons, bottle tops, 
champagne corks, rubber ducks, all sentimental multiples and ranging sizes and conditions subsequently arranged on one side of the apartment so as to occupy 300 square feet with a brightly colored tableau that at once approximated outsider art in its, in its aesthetic while reminding the viewer of humanity's singular capacity to acquire disposable goods. It was a cat's playground. Although Little Grey did occasionally do a running jump into the piecemeal landscape for my benefit, she consistently preferred to harass a volunteer who sat the gallery on the weekend. During his six-hour tenure, Little Grey would leap into the installation about two or three times, particularly when visitors were present, sending all manner of objects flying to such an extent that it would take another 20 minutes for young June Kwok to put everything back in its proper place and always under the adjacent scrutiny of his feline adversary. Within the medium of that material installation, Little Grey reacted to the two of us differently. If I think of this now, it links both to activism and aesthetics. Little Grey refused the restrictions we were imposing upon her territory. Her power to disrupt became a game of sorts, an intervention. How strange she must have thought that these humans so painstakingly replace the trash they have accumulated in such a bizarre and specific order. I think of birds flying overhead on their migratory paths. They must study the strange collapse and erection of city buildings all the time noticing how we fuss over our own civilization, redirecting entire rivers rather than reduce our output of industrial pollution. Part of what's unnerving about the depth of fellow beings is not only that they recede, but also that they see us. We are not alone in this consciousness. I think of the Palace Cat video that went viral a few years ago. Though endangered, Palace Cats exist in Central Asia, living primarily around 14,000 feet above sea level. Unlike most cats, they have round pupils. They are intensely solitary, near threatened on the IUCN red list of threatened species, having been discovered by accident in 1776 by a German naturalist, Peter Simon Pallas. Although he gave them a proper name, Autocolobus Manu, the breed is generally addressed by his family name. In July 2014, a palace cat discovers a secret, hat, secret camera hidden just outside of its den. It stares at the camera, us, hiding ever so slightly behind the rocky entrance of, it, of its home. I wonder what it sees, a strange, perfectly circular, dark, reflective surface. The cat sits up suddenly, noticing perhaps that the camera's reflection also changes. The animal approaches, quickly now with direct authority, trotting just out of view, as though recognizing the camera's limited peripheral vision. Then suddenly, like the ninja cat, Palace's face pops up, engulfing the frame of the camera, so close as to be out of focus, one green eye staring very seriously into the robotic alien lens. It is looking at us. Perhaps it sees its own reflection, perhaps also the robotic contractions of the automatic camera adjusting to changes in light. Meanwhile, the cat's blurred face obliterates the rest of the landscape as it sniffs and blinks intelligently, its own pupils expand, and it drops down again out of view. We hear the soft crunch of its feet walking away. Birds in the background carry on ambivalently, and I imagine the crowd in Minneapolis. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Pamela Rosenkrantz. She's an artist based in Zurich, Switzerland. Her work addresses the shifting philosophical and scientific meanings of the natural and the human during the Anthropocene. Her work melts down and aggregates personal and cultural identifications in an attempt to reach a core illusion of identity as such. She was recently nominated for the Bachter Strasse, I'm, I'm always gonna brutalize words like that. I do the best I can, though. Uh, prize, and her work was featured in the Swiss Pavilion of the 56th Venice Biennale in 2015. 
She has an exhibit opening at Miguel Abreu Gallery in New York, Lower East Side on October 30th. I think everybody will come, yes? And so please join me in welcoming her to give the talk Attraction Attracted. Apparently, we register art as movement neurologically. Any art, even if we look at a monochrome painting, our brain activates the same regions. Thanks. That it uses to detect a predator or prey, or contemplate a ballet dancer's performance or a soccer game. So, from a biological perspective, art triggers physiological responses. Aesthetical strategies based on the analysis of neurological response patterns used in advertisement are highly effective. In my work on color, I'm integrating such methods in order to contrast this effect with their own means. I'm interested how attraction works and how it moves us towards something beautiful, but more even how it alienates us and what it alienates us from. And I'm specifically interested in how attraction can become directly repulsive. Attraction is originally a word of medical jargon, meaning absorption by the body. To be absorbed by our own body is an interesting idea if we think about estrangement. The architecture of the Swiss pavilion in Venice was designed by Bruno Giacometti in 1951. Rumor has it that he won the prestigious competition because the jury was very eager that his famous brother Alberto Giacometti would therefore exhibit his sculptures as Swiss contributor. Apparently, Alberto was never interested though because he did not want to be recognized as a Swiss artist. <clears throat> When I was invited to do the Swiss Pavilion in Venice in 2015, I wanted to approach the beautiful modern building as a relic from past times and turn it into a place that looks like it had been deserted from a future point of perspective. How do I mo move the images forward? How do I stop? <laughs> <laughs> so I need to go on a little bit more. Go back. Get the back there, okay. Yeah. No, I just need to stop at some point, but I will say it again, right? So. so I don't, I don't, when someone comes out, it's all simple, but I don't know. Which number do you want to be at again? Um, I don't know the number, but this is the, the picture I should stop at. Okay. The organization of the pavilion into the classical disciplines of drawing, painting, and sculpture, separative structure of inside and outside, was a useful contradiction to what I wanted to do. By guiding the walk through the pavilion, through an interplay of supposedly immaterial elements such as light, color, scent, sound, I wanted to immerse the visitor into an environment that caused doubt about the nature of our perception. The white coat of the Swiss pavilion was replaced with a green coating and very strong green LED light 
in the pe patio garden that blurred the distinction between inside and outside, instilling the effect that we, st <clears throat> we start to see much more red, the more green there is and vice versa. Smell and sound penetrated the architecture. The synthetic sound of water, for example, generated by an algorithm in real time, disseminated throughout the main space, and the scent evoking the smell of, um, quote, fresh baby skin, billowed through the pavilion, while a synthetic voice read the names of the different components of um, our product, that was the title, in alphabetical order. Um, invading all of our senses, the installation appropriated aesthetic reflexes that both art and commercial culture rely on, rendering them cognitively disturbing. As a placebo effect, it's hard to know here whether what we're experiencing is real or a hallucinatory product of our bodies. Stop. Um, the main space was isolated with plastics and filled with a monochrome thick liquid matching a standardized Northern European skin tone, reminiscent of the carnate used in Renaissance painting to render the visual qualities of human flesh. By using this pink-white skin tone in a volume of about 500,000 liters, filling and therefore blocking the main space of the building, I wanted to confront with the commercially dominant image of white skin color uh, as a mass, like a post-anthropocentric goo. Stop. Inventing substances, like for example the medical industry would, I was giving names to the different agents such as neotin, evoin, bionin, ne and necreon, amongst others. And those were also the captions that usually indicate what a work is made of. Referring to those components, the booklet was giving information on the substance of the work that could not actually be grasped. Many of the components were developed in collaboration. The texts accompanying the names that you probably can read here. I wrote in collaboration with the philosopher Robin McKay, founder of Urbanomic Collapse and organizer of the wave-making original conference called Speculative Realism, Goldsmith. Underlying those components was my interest in our relationship with microbes. About a year ago, it was determined that the placenta is not sterile after all. The growing fetus was earlier believed to thrive in an absolutely clean bubble. Instead, it seems to be confronted with germs through the filter of its mother's biological system and building its future immune system not just from birth, but from the very start of cell division. There are trillions of viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites thriving in each of us right now. Around two pounds of our body weight consists of microbiotic organisms that are much older than humans. The most feared are viruses like Ebola, HIV, or Zika, bacteria like salmonella and parasites like rabies, but next to the few fast and furious scary exceptions, most of the common organisms are rather easy to deal with for our immune system, even when they are pathogenic. New research suggests that many of them are actually keeping us healthy by training our immune system. 
The term microbiome was coined in the 90s, but research is still in the beginnings of sorting out the good from the bad and the many more between. As this community of organisms is so manifold and complex, one speaks about a universe to be discovered within us. The main idea so far is that the more diversity, not just in the environment we live in, but also in the environment that lives within us, the better. One rather simple clinical treatment that has turned into a substantial new industry is the fecal transplant taken from people who have a high diversity in microorganisms. Not just has it shown to heal the colon from an overgrowth of Clostridium difficile, a bacteria that often cannot be cured by antibiotics anymore, but in the way it helped over overweight people to miraculously lose weight. So in Switzerland, there are actually quite some clinics specializing in this now, so private clinics in Zurich, I found. And as we now know, the gut is fundamentally intertwined with our brain, and it influences our psychological sanity. Current research points to how certain bacterial cultures cause anxiety, depression, and even Alzheimer's while others might be able to help alleviate these ailments. But the impact on our state of mind seems to be even more shockingly direct if we take a very common parasite as an example, toxoplasmosis, a neuroactive parasite that seems to influence one of the most existential feelings, sexual attraction. We, alongside mice and other mammals, are only intermediary hosts. Cats are its main target. <laughs> I'm taking a different approach. In this unconscious menage a trois, the parasite wants the mouse to be attracted to the cat. So it travels up to the region of the mouse's brain where sexual arousal occurs. And there, it lets that mouse react to the scent of the pheromones of the cat. This again, makes the mouse dizzy and lets it approach the cat instead of fleeing, so that the cat can much more easily catch it and ingest it. Once inside that cat, the parasite has reached its goal. It can reproduce. Humans are part of this its scheme in more abstract ways. Those who carry it are apparently more attracted to scents that originate from cat pheromones. This scent can be found in many perfumes, allegedly Chanel No. Four, uh, 5, for instance. <laughs> Overall, about 30% of the global populations are infected. Quite a target group. And in France, apparently 60%, so <laughs> the perfume industry. <laughs> um, apparently, this segment of humanity is also more prone to be involved in car accidents, and female carriers are, by the way, also known to acquire more designer clothing. We tend to see sexuality as one of the main markers of our individuality, but not only does our own biological system react to sexual attractions in ways that we can't control, there are also parasites that can neurologically influence or possibly even direct our behavior. It's a provocative and difficult topic and it challenges a fundamental understanding of who we are. Are we many? Are we them or are they us? There are different theories that stipulate the process of how humans became the only naked primate. Set about a million years ago, certain theories believe it to have been triggered by survival mechanisms, parasites, transpiration, and so forth. But mostly, human nakedness is believed to be a product of the evolutionary process of sexual selection. 
Already Charles Darwin speculated in this direction and wrote, no one supposes that the nakedness of the skin is, is any direct advantage to man. His body, therefore, cannot have been divested of hair through natural selection. Man, or more specifically, he implies women, became hairless to attract a mate. And the image which predominantly masters the selection scales in our society is clearly one of the utmost hairless, smooth and homogeneous skin. This surface seems to have a special attraction also as an abstract element. Apparently, the higher percentage of skin on an ad advertisement, the more attention it gets and accident it creates when certain campaigns like H&M like swimwear, for example, are placed in central crossings with high traffic. Particularly useful for cosmetic campaigns, but also more and more important in the advertisement of water. The most important body of water is your own. One of the most famous slogans that Evian had, had trademarked sets the body not as a skin sack, but a precious, flexible, and living sculpture carrying purity inside. The idea that water can clean the body from the inside, purify to the surface with its virgin qualities brought into equation by the anthropomorphic design of the bottle. The natural product water advertised as designed to clean the price-worthy skin-colored subject of health and beauty. Evian was probably the, the one that was working with the most innocent image. In a series about bottled water, I worked with the many water brands that I found exemplary for the misguiding idea of purity. Like air, water is not pure, even though it is transparent. It is a complex composition of, a, of gas and minerals, as well as further not declared substances. It is never really clean too, only more or less clean. Water, also bottled water, can be contaminated with bacteria or other particles, like more and more also residue of medications that threaten our health. And furthermore, bottled water is contaminated with hormone-like substances, even when new regulations are already in place to exclude certain phthalates like bisphenol A. Research shows that many agents that make the plastic smoother that are not yet identified are still in the water. Certain snails that are highly hormone sensitive have been placed to the test inside such bottles and they procreated at accelerated levels up to double the pace than they usually did. These contaminants are not just in PET bottles, but used anywhere abundantly and found in the groundwater itself. Up to certain studies, they might even be responsible for the fact that girls now menstruate earlier and earlier and sperm cells get slower and slower. Even Fiji water, sold on the idea of a sacred source of water from a place, I quote, untouched by man and uncontaminated by the compromised air of the 21st century, cannot escape this unholy connection. Thank you. So for our, our panel discussion, we're going to be joined by one more person, and that is uh, Roger Rothman. Roger Rothman is a Samuel H. Kress Professor of Art History at Bucknell University. He is the author of Tiny Surrealism, Salvador Dali and the Aesthetics of the Small. His articles have been published widely, including Modernism, Modernity, Culture, Theory and Critique, in 2015, he published in a collection titled Art of the Real, Schiller Upside Down Cake, Recipe for a Materialist Ateleological Aesthetic. 
And as he described it to me, it's a, it's a rereading of Rancière's Politics of Aesthetics with an eye toward John Cage. So I think that uh, sets him right in the terrain that we're working with. And so I'd like to invite all our speakers and panelists up and we'll have a discussion. So I don't know if this is the way we want to do it, but I might sit over here since I don't want to contaminate anybody, and it's not just my own bodily fluids, but it's the... Only you. I'll, I will contaminate only you, but four speakers, two mics, hopefully we can pass them. I have a cough already, so... <coughs> so I'm right now in the middle. <laughs> the middle of two coughs. Uh, so I want to thank our speakers. These, these were wonderful presentations, and I think... Uh, in many ways, enlarge our idea of what, it, of what it means to ask this question about the aesthetics of estrangement. And the thing that was interesting to me as well is uh, we could say there was at least three different mediums that we were looking at, the medium of photography, the medium of, of literature and, and James Joyce, and also the literary in your presentation, Caroline. And now I'm thinking in my mind, once you held those two signs up, oh my God, I all of a sudden understand Finnegan's Wake. It's just written in cat. Like all these years I've been misunderstanding this anyways. Sorry, that's an aside. Uh, and, uh, and Pamela, the installations and um, I guess the realm of, of sculpture and installation art, or multimedia art uh, ultimately, but it is I think within the realm of sculpture and the ways you are affecting environments and objects of the other day, every day, that are changing our perception. So. I just wanted to maybe build on that and start within each of your own mediums, with each of your own disciplines, the ways in which you work. How does this question of estrangements, estrangement affect the aesthetic decisions you make? Is it conscious? Is it uh, something that you openly desire? We, we could say that one thing that is different about it is it's not the search for novelty. This is not the pursuit of the ever-expanding new. There is something within it, even if it does present new affects or new, new ideas or new situations, it is not an art argument about the newness of the project that makes its strengths. It sometimes just relies on putting that tension between the familiar and the unfamiliar. Um, does somebody want to pick up on that? I guess I'll start. Well, firstly, I think um, estrangement is built into the medium of photography as I tried to suggest in my opening remarks that the very act of putting a camera to your um, eye is an act of separation from the world and um, however I think that that's only one part of the equation I think that generally photographers tend to be, have a certain kind of alienated view of the world to begin with. That I think that, um, again, photographers are kind of drawn to the medium by um, that particular relationship of feeling separate or alienated or isolated, but also wanting to desperately wanting to make a connection uh, in the world. And um, for me, I feel like those two things need to operate sort of almost simultaneously, the slight feeling of being removed, but also wanting to make a connection. And I know like from when I'm making pictures and um, when there is the moment finally that after months of preparation and there is um, and you see the thing in front of you sort of come into life um, to me that's like one of the few times in my own life where I feel like there's a sense of um, order and symmetry and um, and uh, something I feel like I 
understand and uh, long for. Um, thanks for going first. <laughs> I, uh, I, in some ways, I feel like I actually I don't know how to answer the question in the broadest sense, but um, except maybe to say that when I am having an, experience, an artistic or a literary experience, the ones that are the most powerful for me um, are the ones that kind of uh, interrupt my expectation, my sense of expectation, and introduce a, sense, a kind of instability. Um, that suddenly make me hyper aware of the frame that I'm inside, if that makes sense. Um, and I, in some ways, I guess I feel like the way you were talking about setting up the, the shot might relate to that too. Um. Funny, I started, um, when I was young, I also started with photography. Um, and I can yeah, re relate. You advanced. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't say so. Um, no, but I could relate very much to this distance and closeness that you were talking about. And for me, somehow this, de this uh, relationship developed um, in an interest um, that's also like a, an evolutionary... Um, um, look at why we see how we see and what do we look at and why do we look at it and um, I was um, for a, a while now very interested for example in um, the relationship we have with the color blue and apparently our eye is, um, is very much shaped um, from the time when we were not human yet but under the sea when the eye started to develop and this is responsible why we see much more blue and easier blue than um, than other colors. And it's it's really interesting that um, all over the world, <coughs> apparently besides Ho Holland, they're into orange, but uh, that's more a joke. But apparently, all, all people all over the world have the their fa uh, most um, favorite color is blue. And um, so I started to look into the relationship first that Eve Klein had with blue and then religion, for example. Why, what is our connection to the heaven? Why do we somehow yeah, are drawn in this direction that we want to go up when we die? And then I had this, like, I always combine it then somehow with like, my own freedom of speculating in a sense that um, when we were going to, when we were not yet human, but going to the, towards the land, we had to go up and all we could see was blue light. So that this kind of movement, this um, longing, is still something that is in us, like a direction towards the sky. But now I'm drifting a bit off, sorry. Well, as one who hadn't presented and isn't an artist here, um, it was a real pleasure to be sitting in the, in the second row and experiencing um, what everyone else was in the, um, in the room experiencing. And <clears throat> it triggered for me some reflections on issues that, we ha that have been addressed over the course of this weekend now. Um, Gregory, right in the beginning, you mentioned uh, the experience of terror and awe and then concluded with the beautiful one of the concepts that we've been working through over the course of the weekend has been this issue of, of the beautiful. Um, and at one point, there was a, a proposal that the sublime was somehow um, easier for us to embrace, to get behind, that there's something insufficient um, in the beautiful. As I was watching and experiencing um, your photographs, I got the sense that I was beginning to get, having been prepared by this symposium was that it was sort of an attempt to reach the beautiful um, as something um, nearly unattainable by virtue of this experience um, of estrangement. Um, <clears throat> and 
in um, hearing you, Caroline, give your, your beautiful present meditation on your cat, um, which was a delight for me. I've often thought that cat videos um, deserve a whole lot more um, serious attention, and not, and not just for a kind of um, triple O, um, but also for profoundly political reasons, I think, um, which we could perhaps get into in another time. Um, <clears throat> but um, this, this conjunction or this division that, we found, that we've been discussing between the sublime and the beautiful has led me to think um, quite a bit about what it might have been like at this conference if um, last night everyone had read the first, let's say, 30 pages of one of Kant's pre-critical texts, Observations on the Feeling of the Beautiful and the Sublime, because there he's not talking about judgment, um, but he's talking about feeling, and in particular, pleasure. And I, I imagine that um, others were feeling pleasure as well as I was in these last three presentations. Um, and he distinguishes between the kind of pleasures that are um, ordinary pleasures and those that are of finer feelings. And the distinction is important to him not so much for ontological reasons, but I think ultimately for ethical and political reasons. Finer feelings matter not just because you'll be greater respected or you'll have a deeper sense of pleasure, but ultimately you'll be able to engage in ethical acts via these aesthetic feelings. Um, and so since the conference is called um, aesthetics and activism, one could think um, in a related term about pleasure and politics. And I think that may be some of the things that we're grappling with here. What's the relationship between pleasure and politics? For, for Kant, um, the two dominant feelings that move us from the mere low-level pleasure of enjoying a good meal or the pleasure of being complimented on the cut of your jacket um, might be the pleasure of looking at that jacket and finding it beautiful. And for Kant, um, beauty leads ultimately to care. Um, the sublime, on the other hand, leads to esteem, to the noble. We often talk about the, the sublime as uh, ultimately frightening. But for Kant, I think even more important in this early text is nobility. Um, and that ultimately will lead him to a discussion of reason. And I'm, so I'm wondering to what extent we can uh, develop an, an ethic of beauty, which would be an ethic of care, of the personal, of the relational, versus an ethic of the sublime, which is of reason, of universality, and I think perhaps might bring us all the way back to um, the issue that Elaine Scarry presented, that is um, an, attract, uh, an experience of what she called the what the narrative versus the um, statistical, the narrative being a kind of individual, intimate connection of love, and the statistical perhaps one of esteem. Um, <clears throat> so I would propose that we we consider a question of scale as well, scale in relationship to this notion of the sublime and the beautiful, and the tension that I saw between the enormous trees and their scale, their sublimity, and then the small scale down to the little glasses of water that appeared in so many of those photographs. Um, wow. Um, you know, I, th I think just personally, um, I've always said that like my first ambition, first and foremost, uh, in making my own pictures is to try to make the most beautiful photograph I can. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, that photography is a very limited medium compared to other narrative forms. It's, it's frozen and mute. It's, um, there's no before and after. So whatever story um, or suggested stories you could conjure really needs to be done through photographic form, like light and color and frame in detail, uh, description, um, all of these things kind of working in concert together to create a final image. And, um, but the particular kind of beauty I am interested in, in is one that unsettles the viewer, um, that it's not, um, that it's sort of necessarily complicated, that there are tensions, oppositions, 
Um, and uh, for me, um, uh, you know, despite my want to make just a purely beautiful picture, it never quite happens like that. Like, um, something's always undercut, even uh, against my best efforts. Um, and uh, so that kind of provides a kind of tension between, I think, sadness and beauty, um, which I think is consistent that runs through all of my pictures. But um, I think true beauty is, should be terrifying in s some way because it's shown you something that I think you um, haven't seen before. Yeah, I guess I'm curious about how like the differentiation between terms. I don't want to necessarily get bogged down in words, but it seems to me that the way we're talking about beauty is also slightly different than the way we're talking about aesthetics. And I don't can't quite put my finger on that, but I think it's really interesting. And then as far as where the sublime is located in that spectrum, um, is it a question of scale? Is it a question of um, one's, you know, the largesse of the beautiful instant or the power? Um, or could it actually be something that even just happens, you know, say like with the Copernican revolution where it's just the total transformation of like cosmological order or something like that, like a kind of upheaval. Well, I'm, it, the way that you are discussing estrangement and separation, I think, um, goes a long way towards addressing at least the distinction for Kant, as I understand it. One, esteem and nobility and fear all, all indicate a separation. Um, and uh, beauty, as he's describing it, this feeling of beauty is, is a feeling of, of intimacy and the desire to care for, even in the way that... Um, Elaine was describing the anxiety that we have that a painting that gets stolen might get scratched. I don't know how much anxiety one feels about a uh, building getting scratched. Um, and so it would be interesting to see if some of these ideas of care can be scaled up. And in terms of scale, I was thinking of that, I think it was a near final picture of the shed, the ice fishing shed. Um, an architectural structure of a very small, modest, fragile um, scale that requires or demands or inspires our desire to, to care for it. That is, if we're ethical individuals and we don't just seek to kick it over, or light it on fire. Um, but in ter to the question of whether or not um, we are speaking here of aesthetics as akin to beauty or not, or akin to the sublime or not, I, I, I completely agree. I think um, when Graham described aesthetic experience, as I heard it, it was metaphor. And metaphor, in part, I mean, perhaps metaphors are pleasurable, but they don't necessarily need to be pleasurable. And we don't need to find a metaphor, either beautiful or sublime, but they are some kind of indirect attempt to access the object. Right? And so in as much as aesthetics is defined in that sense, the attempt through via kind of metaphorical uh, gesture to reach towards the object, then it's not necessarily aesthetics in the sense that we would describe, that you were describing in terms of awe and beauty. Um, um, I mean, one th tension I'm particularly interested in is um, a kind of tension between estrangement and intimacy that sort of those two things together in a single image uh, where you have something very private something very um, sort of um, you know uh, intimate but kind of um, shown or um, in a kind of a removed way so like my, uh, in, in my case, my pictures can never be mistaken for like um, uh, uh, um, uh, just like casually 
um, made uh, intimate picture um, like Arbus, for example, um, or uh, Winogrand or any of that generation of photographers. It's very pulled back, very um, detached, very formal, but we're um, creating a kind of stage for a private, uh, um, very um, sort of uh, exposed moment. I think it's uh, important to notice that it's, it's not only maybe the tension between estrangement and intimacy as a content for the photograph, but it's actually produced within the aesthetics of the photograph itself. And it's that uh, unnerving moment of you don't know quite how to put the emotion that one has in response to it. It's not melancholia, it's, it's, and it's not uh, sympathy or empathy. It's, it's something that's uh, broken, a relationship between what you're looking at and the qualities that it's giving you. You're looking at the photograph, you accept it to be a reality, it looks like the real, but then there, there begins to be problems. The light ends up moving in ways that you uh, don't assume to be natural movements of light. The interior spaces begin to compress right down to the tops of the door frames in a very disturbing manner. The mirrors are reflecting two sides of one face, and we know this all the time because we often in the bathroom look at a mirror and know that our, our face is different on both sides, but the way that it then gives a single photograph two completely different conflicting um, emotional responses to the same physical individual, all of this starts to speak to the the kind of opening up of the construct, right? And this is this I think is really for me one of the important things about aesthetics in relationship to estrangement. And I don't know how it goes to beauty, and I don't know exactly if it falls in line with uh, the necessity for an ethical behavior from it. it. It might, I think, Elaine Scarry's argument of justice coming from beauty is, is amazing. I hadn't put it in the Kantian terms before, and that's wonderful to hear. But uh, this moment that it opens up where one begins to doubt the assumptions that we have about the construct of the real in which we exist. And photography does that incredibly well. Now, how that goes into architecture, and I know that I'm maybe the only architect here, but we are in a, a, we are in a school of architecture. <laughs> okay. Do you want to do it? Yeah. So not, not having had the pleasure to walk through um, the space that you constructed by um, transforming it with lights, coats of paint, and um, an, a, a plat a field that could not be walked on, could you walk us through, to some extent, your experience of that space, even if you have some sense of the before and after of what, the, what your own experience of the exhibition space was prior to your transformation of it and then after? Um, pra the the impression that I had at the beginning, I mean, I, I of course I, I knew the pavilion from before, but when I was invited to actually um, show my own art and um, there, I was at first um, for quite a while too impressed somehow by the legacy and the beauty of the modern <laughs> building, and um, but also it. Um, it instilled this uh, problem that I see how we relate to these times and how we are not somehow getting further. And in this sense, I also thought this example was interesting that um, somehow Alberto Giacometti's figure would actually work very well in, in this architecture and how, um, like, and, uh, then it helped me somehow to create very encompassing approach so that I would deal with the architecture as like a container, I would almost say. So like similar as like I filled the bottles, I would somehow fill it with different um, uh, layers and levels of uh, what happens with, with our perception and not actually show an artwork directly. I, 
I have a hard time to explain now, I realize. But you turn the architecture into uh, the container, this, in the same way that you turn a plastic water bottle into a container in the way in which you fill it with the flesh-colored liquid. You've turned that architecture into that as well. And there's something amazing that the power of estrangement can be put right down on color. Because when people usually talk to me about color, it seems so abstract. It's like, what do you... I, I don't know how to address it. But then the moment color becomes instantiated in a condition, in a site, in a material, in a place, then it becomes really uh, um, different. And that difference, let's say, if you're moving between that cyan green and that pink, we're all moving between cyan green and pink this, these days because of our shift into our digital monitors. So you could claim it's a technological thing. But what you were able to produce in there, if I'm, if I'm experiencing it uh, correctly within my own estrangement, is the ways in which we become disgusted, the ways in which beauty becomes disgust, the ways in which that can lead between the sensual and the medicinal. That at one level, the green is giving me a, a medicinal, almost laboratory-like response that speaks to me about my body being in pain and injured and uh, unwell. And then yet at the other side, there's uh, the whole floor becoming flesh, which is a completely different response, all kind of brought into one experience of architecture, I would say. Um, um, By the way, you should bring one of these Yale water bottles back with you. I have some already emptied for the plane. They're too good. <laughs> no. <laughs> I would, I, um, regarding this experience, what I wanted to do is also, because first you would go through the green, right? And then there was this one corridor where um, only certain people, like a certain number of people could go in. And then you had to be somehow fast. And as long as you, because you waited outside, your eyes were so trained to the green, then the, the pink liquid would actually look quite red. So it goes more into this idea that also like skin is just a, a membrane where our blood shines through. So um, no, but I'm also like, I'm very interested in how colors have this like direct medical or medicinal effect, you said. In, for example, also if you think about blue light of the screen, how it like influences our, our hormone system directly, how in the evening we need the red light to produce the melatonin and all these um, impacts that we have to become more and more canny with to actually, yeah, we, we actually have to deal with it much more on a daily basis. I'm out of stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we could go on. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say my architecture bit here. Um, so there's, there's this uh, Walter Benjamin quote, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase, that architecture is consumed by the masses in a state of distraction habitually. Uh, one way to extend that is to understand that it implies that architects are in charge of the aesthetics of the background of reality, all the stuff that people ignore. Right? So that puts a lot of pressure on us uh, as a discipline to think about what it means to introduce change into that background of reality. And at what level do people understand how artificial its construct is? And at what level is one make one aware of that? At what level then do you introduce something new to it? And I've found within this discourse that's extending from a number of the topics that we've been discussing today and yesterday as well, is that there's a possibility for architecture to think about its interest in aesthetics not through the production of the novel, idiosyncratic, beautiful thing that stands against that background as the difference of the way in which we occupy the world. Architecture as the art object against the neutrality of the background of the world. But that architecture could begin to think about itself as one that raises awareness of the background and not necessarily intellectual awareness only, but that through aesthetics, one could begin to see that background that is our everyday world other than we'd commonly assumed. And 
I think that's something that, that all of your art has actually just done in the presentations you did here. I mean, one of the things I think that was great about this session is you guys did art to us, right? You didn't show us a presentation about the art, you did art to us, and I love that. Uh, and so it brought this real kind of visceral expression to it. Um, in a way, uh, you, were, you were behaving kind of like architects. You were making us uh, more invested in that background of reality and causing us to think about it differently and consider it in other ways. Uh, I don't know if that's, I know, is not a question, it's a statement. I just had to say it anyway. Uh, well, I think, um, you know, in the end, we're all in the same boat to a certain extent, and that is like attempting, no matter whether you're um, a, a writer or a filmmaker or a musician, architect, um, whatever the case may be, you're attempting to will something into existence that has a kind of particular subjectivity. And in um, the case of an architect, and certainly in, uh, in my case, working with like a large crew and it's, it's um, almost the paradox in a way of like um, having to work in collaboration with all these people, but at the, end of, at the end of it, that the thing has to reflect something particular, something that um, reflects the artist's view of the world. I guess also one of the things that it makes me think about suddenly is risk. Um, and I'm not exactly where to put it, except that it seems to me, and again, sort of as like a, one uninitiated in the architectural discourse, it seems to me that the risk would be much higher somehow as far as what a type of experimentation would look like versus, I mean, even just personally for me, like, taking a risk with an essay, of course, in my like neurotic experience, that probably seems astronomical and terrifying. But I mean, it just seems like I'm not, there are words on a page actually. And so uh, I hesitate to say that it's easier to take risks in art um, because I think that's also problematic. But I wonder if there is one of the things, one of the benefits of imagination and going through thought experiments is that you can play things out before they be, have to become material and before you need to raise money and before you need to make a hard, fast argument. Let's do that. To the crowd. Um, well, thank you all. I found <clears throat> it was a really beautiful uh, panel session. I, I have a question for Gregory, just out of curiosity, because to me, um, it, it was really interesting to hear you talk about your photography as, as a frozen moment in time and how you relate estrangement more between you and the subject through the technology of the camera. While when I'm looking at your photos, I always think the estrangement is more about the picture estranging the before and then after. Um, much more like the medium of film than photography to me. There seems always in your photography a hint towards something that will happen or has happened that is eerie, kind of, uh, it was interesting to hear you mention David Lynch in the beginning, um, which completely resonates with, with my reading of your photography, but when you talk about it, you, you didn't touch the subject of um, the moment just being basically um, a, an aesthetic uh, re re reference of some sort to a future that may or may not happen or to some kind of a speculative past that may or may never have had happened. Is that something? Sure, uh, just um, on a side note, uh, mentioned David Lynch. And I remember when I was a student here, I was actually in this building, um, photography department was on this floor, 
So I have a lot of estranged feelings about <laughs> the building itself. Um, but uh, the, in 1986, uh, I remember seeing Blue Velvet for the first time at the York Cinema and um, speaking of before and after, that absolutely changed my uh, perspective, um, just seeing that film. Uh, and I feel like I wasn't the same person after seeing it. And um, so I just want to relate that. Um, I mean, as I said, photography is a kind of limited medium that, um, unlike a movie, there is, um, it's just a singular image frozen uh, without before and after. Uh, um, but um, it's, I'm limited um, as an artist too, I feel, um, in that I think almost exclusively in terms of single images as it is, and I think that's partially because I'm dyslexic and, um, and uh, I don't think naturally in linear um, narratives, I think in terms of singular moments. And so, but in a way it's a luxury that I put all of my energies into making a single picture and trying to make it as sort of powerful as I can, you know, um, uh, putting all of my energies into that single image. And I've often said, and it's um, really true, that when I make a picture, when I'm sort of planning it, um, I, I don't even have an inkling about what happens before or after, that I want it to remain a mystery even to myself. And in that, case, in, in that way, you allow the viewer to bring their own stories to it, you know? And like, um, and once I make it, then it's out in the world and um, I, and then people project their own particular narratives. It's right next to me here. How lucky. But no, the, um, I feel the need for more structure in a way here because it um, seems to me that, uh, I mean, you know, always in the face of, you know, interesting art and uh, thinking about uh, estrangement or alienation, which are different things, I'm assuming, um, that, that uh, you know, we're fascinated by the subject matter. It's incredibly uh, compelling. We all know kind of what we mean. And, and, um, but I, it seems, I mean, um, that it's inescapably about identities and identity. So that, let's just say you uh, invest uh, your identity in a uh, work of uh, art and, uh, or, in a wor or a production of any kind, and you try to find the stake of your identity in there, you know, and that's what's at stake in a certain sense. But then that's not going to be enough because, you know, you can, it's the, pro, it's the dilemma of the poet, poet who writes a poem completely generated by an identity issue, let's say a reflective issue, but never finds its way across the threshold, you know, into, let's say, the space of estrangement or something like that. So it's, um, and, and so to, it's, it's true, everybody will project into, and yet I think there's something more you're looking for. You're not just, you know, it's not just uh, the stake of your identity, it's the stake of your identity taken into the public domain in some way, right, across the threshold. And that is, a, you know, really tricky and difficult and strange, you know, and that's a kind of strange in itself, that, but it's helped out by the fact that nothing is more interesting to us than what's outside us, because that's how we define ourselves, right? We define ourselves as not everything outside of us, but as our, you know, that's the formation of identity. There's another, but there's other form, there are other ways of describing that. I mean, I think of the way the surrealists, you know, got across the threshold by being, uh, you know, they didn't go into the blurry, dreamy psychosis space or psychotic space. Uh, they wanted the psychotic and they wanted the dreamy, 
but they did it through extreme precision of drafting a kind of extraordinary preciseness to the to the representational you know, the rep and and it was so sharp it was like how could it be so sharp if it's talking about something as as difficult as consciousness or psychosis or something um, another thing comes to mind around this, which has to do with what, uh, what Pamela's working with, which is the eco-identity in a certain sense, where immunology is now, you know, the new frontier for medicine. I mean, it's like, why is that? Because the immune system is the cognitive system for the body in some way. It recognizes the enemy, and it, and it fends them off. And um, there's a great essay by Edgar Morin on this about eco-identity of some kind. So it's, the, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a whole different, the, the difference he makes between our classical enlightenment identity, hum, human identity, and the eco-identity is he says the eco-identity is not emancipatory, that it, it's not about freedom. That and always our uh, kind of enlightenment identity is about uh, you know the emancipation project and so the, it's not about freedom because it's engaged with of course the autopoietic system and you know the protection and self protection of the of the organism that has to be energetically open and so on so there's a I mean these just seem to me to be partly it's I I, I don't think it should be diagrammed the problem of estrangement. But I just feel as if it needs always to somehow get leverage or traction off of something or, and not just drift into a generally you know, haunted house or whatever the various tropes we have for it. Um, and I, I, I think all your work makes it across the threshold. So I'm thinking you're thinking very precisely about this stuff. I, I guess in some way I feel like I, the, maybe part of what's needed is the thing in relief. And I don't know if this gets sort of slips too much into the question of foreground and background. Um, but I, I, I think you're right that you can't just have a sense of alienation in a vacuum. Like you kind of need to be feel alienated from something specific. Or And again, I think maybe it's it's also worth thinking about what the distinction between estrangement and alienation might be, but um, I wonder, it's harder, of course, for me to think about my own work in this way, but at least um, in terms of what we were looking at today, I feel like there's, there seems to be a kind of inversion. Like, um, I feel my impression of Pamela, your work, one of the things you do is you sort of create this externalized experience of the body or and then it kind of becomes uncanny because you sort of identify this thing as being like related to flesh or skin tone but it's not really where it should be and I don't know um, and in some way I feel like maybe in your photographs there's also this you have a sense of access or privilege but you're still removed from pr proper entrance or resolution Well, I like the word threshold quite a bit. And I'm not quite sure if I am made it through the threshold quite yet. I um, feel like I'm kind of separated from um, whatever it might be. And um, in this particular body of work, I'm, I was very conscious of like the relationship of uh, um, interior and exterior space, and um, I was very influenced, um, I think maybe more so uh, painting than uh, move, film or photography, and I do remember when I was going through that kind of dark period, there was a really beautiful show I saw at the Met called um, Rooms with a View, and um, so like a historic 19th century painting show, figures uh, in interior spaces and um, various windows, uh, doorways, and I was very struck by that. And I think I used that as a kind of motif to talk about that 
very question of identity and and um, and uh, separation. Um, you know, these pictures are definitely by far the most personal pictures I've ever made. I've used like family members and people who are very close to me in the pictures, but still, um, they tell you nothing about sort of everything and nothing about me at the same time. And that um, they're not directly autobiographical, and, but I think that they're made from um, a kind of personal truth, I could say. So I don't know if this is answering your question, but it's just a kind of meditation on the question of identity and trying to also separate the psychology of the image from the psychology of the maker. Uh, wait, no, I, I got it. Um, <clears throat> I had a question that was a bit more specifically for Pamela, but I was wondering if you could talk. It's me. It's, it's me. I'm not going to talk. I'm standing. Uh, if you could talk about your association with science and um, maybe the disenchanting nature of your work and how you might respond to the word beauty that was being talked a lot about. Last, the last part, respond to How would you respond to how the word beauty was being used? Because Sorry, my beauty. beauty. Mm -hmm. Sorry. My hearing is a bit um, bad because of the cold. Um, science and beauty. Okay. Um, somehow, um, also referring to the question for a threshold, somehow, I mean, in the end, I think I'm not able to actually explain the threshold. I just, I'm a, as an artist, I, for me, I'm able to somehow give a, a background and guide through what interests me, but I can't really fix it into like a structure that is clear, just like somehow point towards the intensities that I go through to create my work. And um, science is, I think, we're in a time where science has become very approachable, very... Um, like through the internet, in information has um, new ways that, in a way that we can follow our interest, we can follow with it with feelings like fear, for example, hypochondriac um, meandering through the internet, or like um, looking for help, or we can also just follow like a curiosity uh, in a totally different way, and we can find find many many different and some very reliable and some other like very high, um, how do you say, um, uh, he, he, um, like theories that are not scientifically proven. And I'm interested in like a complexity of these um, ideas to somehow um, understand the, the time we live in, not just like, um, not, not, not just uh, rationally but also emotionally and um, regarding beauty um, yeah as I tried to explain I um, or, and cannot really explain um, there are these elements that um, we know interest us from on a biological level that approach us when um, for example, one thing I, I'm recently more interested in again is the uncanny valley. Like um, robotics uh, have this problem that the more beautiful um, um, like a, a, a robot becomes, the, the more we actually respect it as something looking human and beautiful, but also the more it approaches it, the more uncanny it, it becomes. And, um, yeah, th these are things that interest me. Hello. Um, I'm so honored to see you, all of you. 
And um, I just wanted to say to Gregory um, about the thresholds, one of the things that I've loved about your work since I first saw it, and I loved it since I first saw it in the early 90s, is that um, the, way you, the way you introduce the thresholds is that the thresholds are not thin and they're not rigid, they're very thick and they're full of like ambiguous spectral beings, you know, that are sort of semi there and semi not there, like you sort of say, yeah? And um, this was a major, major motivation for me to write this book about ecology that I, I wrote called Ecology Without Nature. And um, when I saw those twilight pictures, uh, a feeling blossomed inside me. And, and actually, that's the definition of judgment that Kant is using. It's not a judgment like I'm judging this, good or bad. It's like it's an, it's an intuition that's blossoming inside me like an alien being. In a way, the beauty experience itself is a kind of non-human alien being that I'm having inside me where I can almost prove that there are other beings other than me without even needing to like point to them somehow. Like I'm having this very strange experience that is like not my ego, you know? Um, which means that it's always got this kind of halo around it of strangeness, actually, that it inevitably doesn't have this, like Kant tries to control it, he tries to anthropocentrically scale it so that you lose that kind of halo of weirdness that's around it. And so, yeah, I find your work so beautiful because it does have this, it includes this halo of strangeness. Thank you. <laughs> I, I mean, it just occurred to me to just say one, I mean, this is a minor point, but obviously these images we're seeing today are uh, projected onto a screen and um, and in that way, they're a, a kind of mirage. Um, and, you know, over the course of the last, you know, 20 years or so, this question of the actual physical object, the print on a wall, has become a very challenging one for um, certainly photographers as um, we all encounter pictures primarily through screens, through um, uh, phones and uh, computers and the internet. And rarely now do we encounter a picture that is a physical object. And I think this goes back into the question of beauty and that, um, you know, um, I still strongly feel that um, it's possible to make pictures that exist as physical objects that are on the wall that are mean something and that kind of counteract maybe 99% of the rest, all the other images that we experience, which are by definition meant to be disposable or, um, um, or certainly never meant to be looked at again. You know. Platforms, yes, exactly. Hi, um, I, uh, I, had a, I wanted to introduce another term in uh, distinction from beauty, um, which was the erotic, because I thought that that was, um, to me, that struck me as a theme um, in all of the presentations. Um, Gregory, you spoke about uh, voyeurism, uh, longing, uh, the absolute separation of the object, uh, from the object of desire. And I felt in, with the rapport with the, the cat, I think that's a great example of sort of un untranslatable otherness of the subject and reminded me of an artwork by um, Carly Schneeman, Infinity Kisses. I don't know if you know where she, she documented every morning a um, really full-on kiss with her male cat that was just his, it originated as an act of um, love and desire on his part, not on hers. Um, and... Um, and then I thought also about, I mean, I think this, this idea of the erotic doesn't foreclose the relationship between the human and the, the, the non-human, or even the non-animal. I mean, I was completely struck by this, 
desire of the bacteria for the cat that's so strong that it kind of paralyzes mice with pheromonal abandon. Um, it's not something I'd associated with bacteria before, but that seemed to me a kind of an erotics um, of, of desire. That, and so I feel all of this is coming out of the, the aesthetics of, a, of estrangement. Um, I don't know, the same when you were talking about hair, like the estrangement of the human from its hair, if only to somehow thereby like even more fetishize the hair against the naked skin uh, even more. And so I, th this is what struck me about your, the, the presentations. And I thought that, you know, in a simple way, the consequence for architecture is that architecture also estranges you. It estranges people from, I mean, you see this so obviously in Grovey's photographs, and estranges people from one another and makes them kind of long to be together, or estranges people from other spaces and fills them with this kind of uh, incredible longing to, to be in that space or to inhabit it in some way. So uh, I just wanted, in response to this kind of idea of sublimity versus beauty, I just wanted to offer this idea of the erotic as a kind of different direction you could go. It's great. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, my first thought in response to that is <clears throat> to what extent um, does an erotic experience, um, is it wholly selfish? Um, is it designed for one's own pleasure? And to what extent does it actually reach out to the other or others? Um, that is with my preoccupation to see if it's possible to move from the aesthetic to the ethical, right? Um, insofar as there's some kind of reciprocity that takes place in the erotic, um, but insofar as it simply is a desire to have for oneself, I think that would be fundamentally different than the kinds of finer feelings, again, to use Kant's term, that he's describing because one can't construct an ethic out of selfish desires. And in the case of the bacteria, um, it may be hospitable, well, for the cat, that the um, bacteria has that particular erotic desire for the mouse's uh, brain tissue certainly isn't helpful to the particular mouse, right? Um, that might be at least my, my first thought in response to how we, we might map the relationship of the erotic onto um, the terms that we've been working with so far, but in as much as one perhaps might want to trigger erotic pleasures in others, that strikes me as something perhaps different, right? I mean, that's, that's a gift-giving act, um, and thus um, not, it's not pr um, provoking the erotic in oneself, but enabling the erotic for the other. Um, re regarding the human-non-human -human distinction with the cat, I thought it's um, interesting that um, regarding pets, I don't think you, it's um, so clear to make this distinction because human shared um, their living space for such a long time already with cats, dogs, or, and they, they actually changed a lot. Like cats, for example, meow, because we, we breeded them uh, to meow, but a cat, like a, a wild cat, a natural cat, original cat, a wild cat, uh, I can't, <laughs> it, it wouldn't meow anymore after it's, um, it's not uh, a baby anymore. So the cat actually meows because we think that's cute. So we are, react to the cat, we nurture the cat, and so we not only share microorganisms with the cat for a long time, but but we also trained it, we bred it. It's, it's similar to us in some way. Um, hi, thank you for that presentation. Uh, really inspiring work. Um, I had a sort of follow-up question um, kind of from last night's um, closing discussion. It was about, it's a, it's a sort of general question with with your work, and more specifically with Gregory, your work, and Pamela, your work, how much you reveal the sort of uh, constructions or armature of construction. Gregory, you were saying that your work 
there's a lot of production which goes into it. Um, and then within the image yourself, within it, the images we see, we don't necessarily see that production. That's kind of, but it's, it's kind of some, somehow in the background um, and present in the overall discussion. And then you also sort of present the photographs as a, a series. So in, in some ways that the part gets lost and then we have a sort of larger holistic construction which is with the music. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, there's a certain paradox, I think, in my work that I um, want all of that uh, production value, if you want to call it that, um, to be on some level invisible or transparent. Like, I want, um, in fact, I work very uh, sort of hard to erase any suggestion of um, anything that would reveal the production, let's say, like um, in the actual print, there's this kind of um, um, hyper focus, you know, the composited images. So every single thing has a kind of weight and authority. Um, um, and uh, but it's all, uh, and all the lighting and, um, and, and the props, it's all, for me, it's all in the service of creating a world that the viewer can fall into, like as you would with um, um, a movie or, or, a, or a novel. Like, you don't want to, really be aware of the apparatus of the production. Um, you, yet, it's all there to kind of um, bring the world to life. Um, and um, in that way, I, I do consider myself a realist. Um, like I'd say I'm a kind of psychological realist and I'm using um, the various production value to kind of create a heightened description of uh, of of uh, of the world that I've created. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, it's a great explanation that it's not through the exposure of process or procedure that we uh, find somehow the 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 critical fingernail to grab onto your work, but it's through the overall aesthetic experience that we cannot reduce down to the methods in which you have built it up, nor can we reduce it up to solely our own sensorial or emotional states. It's something that focuses us on it as an artifact, as a photograph, and as a world, as an object. And just the fact that you you did tell us now it's a composite photograph and it's the high level of focus that goes into it at every level. Things like that, lenses don't do that. Lenses blur, depth of field. And we don't see that way either because we've got these little machines halfway inside our head that are mediating and defamiliarizing the world constantly. So to give that object that reality means that you actually have to go through abstractions, but it's not the revealing of the abstraction that produces the possibility of the aesthetic. It's the engagement and then the tension between those qualities and the object we know or think we know that we're looking at. Um, wonderful. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, turn it over to, to Mark. Thank you, everybody. Let's give a round of applause.